Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 34, Databases. Take it away, Jason. Hey, everyone. So, uh, uh, just real quick, I know we promised the episode on Swift. It is coming. Patrick and I are desperately uh, it's coming swiftly. Patrick and I are desperately trying to learn Swift, but uh, it's taking a little bit longer than definitely I anticipated. Uh, more just because you know we want to. Uh, there's not a whole lot out there, right? And so um, you know a lot of it is just understanding how the language works and things like that. So we'll definitely get to that. But in the meantime, we'll definitely uh, 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 we have a really awesome show here on databases. That I don't know. I know what you're talking about man. I already wrote three top of the chart performing. App Store games. Oh yeah, Flappy yep. Patrick. Yeah, and, and I uh, quit my job, and I'm a, I'm a billionaire. <laughs> oh man. Um, so, <clears throat> from the mailbag, Ash Booth uh, wrote in, and he was uh, said, "Hey guys, you know, I discovered the show about a month ago. Um, you know, I'm an AI slash machine learning PhD student, and um, what's it like to go from academia to you know industry to working?" Uh, well, they're both they're both working, but what's what's it like to go from working at a university, uh, or or studying at a university, to a full time job? Maybe I should answer this because I, you went straight from elementary school to working. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I did have a job for most of high school and college, a full time okay. job. Anyways, um, so. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You go first, and then I'll try. Oh, in. I was just joking, actually. <laughs> okay. Well. So uh, for me, okay. I only did. Oh, oh, I only did uh, undergraduate, so four years of college. So it's not. I'm not an academic, uh, long-term student. Well, so you for did me, a master's, right? What I did a master's while I was working. So. Oh, I see. So you kind of did. Yeah, that makes sense. So I already started working, and I had an internship actually after my second year of school. So I went to school for two years and I had already worked. And I think that eased some of it. So I recommend internships are a really good thing. Oh, definitely. Um, because engineering internships are almost always paid. I've never heard of an unpaid engineering internship. Right. Um, and so you get money. That's cool. And then also like it does expose you for like, you know, going back to school for the remainder of the time to like know what to study and what you're interested in and what the real life, I'm doing little quotes here, is all about. Um, but I mean, I think the biggest transition is from the fact that like, an academic is perfectly to defi- say things like always and never. And in real life, you can't really say those things because you have to bend or break a lot of rules because you may be working on older technology or like the style of your team is just this. And even though academically, you may be able to show like this paper says this, this is the more optimal way to do this. It's like, well, we already have coded this. We've already invested the time and tested it and you know, whatever. Um, just yeah, kind of that's realizing. a good point. You know, yeah. like uh, we were talking about this um, today at lunch that, uh, you know, in Python, in the Python uh, compiler, <laughs> there's something called Tim sort. And uh, uh, it's named after Tim. And the, the idea is, um, you know, they need to do some kind of sorting. And again, I, I'm not going to go into the details. I don't even really know the details. But t- to some extent, part of the Python compiler needed to sort something. Um But they knew something about the data, like they knew certain chunks of the data were already in some kind of order. And so Tim Sort, uh, you know, took advantage of some of the assumptions they could make about the data to sort faster than n log n, right? Which, um, just to recap, like if you take computer science 101, one of the first things you'll learn is that uh, the two fastest sorts Theoretically, quick sort and merge sort both run in n log n, uh, but Tim sort, uh, you know, given the data that Tim sort works on, runs in, in faster than n log n. And so th- the point is, you know, when you get down to industry, you're not working on like theoretically theoretical data. I mean, you're, you're working on practical data that um, you can make a lot more assumptions on, and so a lot of the theory kind of goes out the window. That is, that's my biggest thing. I don't know. Yeah, I guess my biggest thing is, uh, 
Um, I kind of look at it this way, like going into academia, like as a student or as a faculty or, or what how, or as a research assistant or what have you, um, is a lot like owning your own business. Um, like as a student, you're really in charge of your own fate more than you are as an employee. Like as a student, you can very quickly within a matter of three or four months, you can fail out of college, right? But you know, outside of like sexually harassing someone or, or something which which is very unlikely, like which would require like you to be a sociopath, like outside of those crazy things, you'll almost never get fired within three to four months. Like like for you to be fired for, for, for most companies, for you to be fired for performance reasons, I mean, you have to actually be it takes like 12 months. Yeah, you have to be messing up for a long time. Right. I mean, you really have to be going down the wrong path and, and know it for a while. But school, I mean, you could, you could, you know, really just like, you know, especially when you get to the higher levels, like a PhD um, or even worse, a professor, like if you don't write, you know, if you don't get enough grants accepted and you don't get enough papers accepted, um, you know, f there are people who want, you know, there are conferences that are looking for good papers, but they're also very selective. And if you don't get these things through, then you don't get funding and then you have to kind of beg your department to float you and that, uh, you know, ends badly. And, and um, it's so easy to fail, just like running your own business and to, to just be destroyed in your career. Um, but then on the flip side, what you're given in academia is, is a lot more freedom. Like in school, you can study whatever you want. You know, if you want to be a biologist, you'd be a biologist, you know, you, d you study anything. Um, but you know, if you get a job as say a software engineer, then, then, uh, obviously it's much more limited, right? So those are sort of the trade-offs. Well, the other, the other, well, there's, I, I guess I think about two other things. One is that like in school, almost everything was whatever we call green field work. So like everything is completely unwritten, right? You're writing stuff from scratch. And most of the time when you're working on a job, there's already something that exists. Yeah, that's it might true. just be requirements, but it's it's very rare. I mean, almost all of my time spent coding is working in other people's code, working in legacy code. You know, even when I'm writing new code, it has to fit in with other people's code, right? And that's, yep. There is some of that in school, but it's you know not as much. Um, and then the other thing is like the continuity of work. Like you could be working on the same thing. So at least in like if you're doing graduate work and research, it's probably different. But like an undergraduate. You know, you're doing little projects, but there's typically a long project will last a semester. And most times projects are multiple per semester, right, in a class. Um, and at work, like you could easily be working on basically the same thing for years, you know, but easily, you know, months. And you just every every night you go home and you come back the next morning and you're doing the same thing you were like the night before. And you just keep doing it over and over and over again, you know. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, actually, there's this... Uh there's this interesting TED talk, and we'll link to it in the show notes. But it's about uh, what makes us feel good about our work. And um, the reason why I bring it up is they did this experiment where, <coughs> where you, uh, um, they had two, they had a control group where they, um, they started off paying them five dollars to build this Lego. So they had a box of Lego. And you had to build something. I think it was like a robot or something. And they had the instructions. And um, after you built it, they, you know, put it aside. They like, took it to another room. And they gave you a new box and told you to build another one. But this time it was only for, I think it was like $4. And they had some kind of power function, right? And so most people, like, kept building the robots until it was down to, like, $0.70. Cents. Um, then for the second group of people, they... Um, had them build the robot, and then they destroyed the robot in front of them, like disassembled it, and had them build it again. And that second group, like, only built the robot once or twice, and then said they were done. And so, like, grad school is a little bit like being in that second group, because you do a lot of work, you, you, a lot of it is alone. And even being a professor, you know, a lot of the work you're you're really like in your own world. I mean, you have students who are part of your team who kind of report to you, but you're really on your own. And a lot of the work, this is, this is my opinion, so take it with a grain of salt, but a lot of that work kind of gets destroyed. Um, you know, it goes into some research paper and then hopefully someone in industry picks it up and does something with it. 
but I felt like there's a lot of that kind of being in that second group. But uh, when you are in industry, it's true that like you sometimes can feel like you're a cog in a much larger machine. But on the flip side, it's like, yes, you're part of a larger machine that's doing something pretty amazing. And so that's sort of like the, the big trade off I see. So. All right. On to news. News. So um, this is pretty topical. There's a database, Rethink DB. And uh, the impression I get is I don't know too much about Rethink, but the impression I get is they're trying to, uh, you know, kind of compete with MongoDB and some of these other document stores. Um, and they released a new version that has a bunch of cool new features. So uh, if you've never heard of Rethink DB, uh, after you're done listening to this podcast and you are a database expert, you can definitely check it out. Oh, we can offer certifications. You're a certified <laughs> oh, yeah. database expert. <laughs> nice. We should team up with Udacity or something. Oh, I, di- I got that email too. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I just I was thinking of that. Yeah, anyone who uh, has an Udacity account got emailed uh, a couple days ago from Sebastian Thrun himself um, saying that they're going to start offering accreditation. All right. Uh, this next article is yours as well. DHCPIO. Oh. What is that? Yes, DHCP. So I used to use uh, DYN DNS, and actually I still use it. Um, and they they uh, stopped doing free, um, you know, uh, free host names. Um, I didn't but know I, that. Yeah, oh. they stopped. But I had already kind of um, been using them for a while, and I got kind of nervous because uh, I have like. A bunch of things tied to that DNS scripts, things like that. So I just said, forget it. I'll pay them. I think it was like, you know, twenty dollars for the year or something like that. But uh, now I found out about this DHCPIO. I'm going to try it uh, sometime this week, and it looks like it's exactly what DYN DNS used to be, where um, it's free and and uh, you could just um, um, you set up some kind of service that updates your IP automatically and things like that. So I'll check it out. I'll report back next show and let you guys know uh, if it's if it's solvent or not. Um, <laughs> but uh, at least, you know, it's good that there's other alternatives out there. Nice. So my next one was an interesting article I was reading. It's called Folding a Fractal. So fractals are, uh, I think, you know, a, 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 for some reason, programmers are fascinated by fractals and mathematicians. Why do you think that is? I think because it's just like we don't do uh, at least a lot of programmers I know aren't they don't consider themselves very artistic, but it's kind of something where you turn a little knob, you change a little equation, and you get something kind of beautiful out. Okay, that makes right? sense. It's like computer generated, like uh, procedurally generated things, right? Programmers will like build all sorts of. I always see procedurally generated, you know, moonscapes and landscapes and treescapes and. Yeah, people are right. just like really like a simple algorithm that creates something complex. Okay. Uh, Conway's game of life, right? Like all these things, like you know, complexity from simplicity. Um, and this article takes an interesting look, which I had never heard about before, for the um, I believe it's the Julia fractal, and 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 basically talks about the symmetry of it and how you know you always hear the typical thing like you know you. A, a fractal is something that takes place on the complex plane. So the vertical axis is the imaginary component and the horizontal axis is the real component. I think I'm getting that right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, you, you take a point there and you apply, you put it into an you know equation, you get a result, and then you take the result and put it back into the same equation. You keep doing that. And either the results will stay under some limit or will kind of spiral out to an infinite number. And... Uh, Based on that, you kind of make colorings and whether it's in the set or out of the set and, uh, you know, these beautiful things arise. And this one, you know, you typically hear about in this very mathematical description that it's kind of dry, kind of boring, I guess. But it's interesting. And this one, they talk about it in a way of kind of like folding and transformations. And you'll have to read it. They have some kind of cool animations. They talk about it. And it's just a different way of looking at it, but, you know, kind of interesting that even with a different approach, you can kind of arrive at the same thing and kind of have a different insight in how and why the shapes arise like they do. Yeah, this is really cool. I'm actually on their website now. This guy's website is incredible. Like, Yeah, but it's poor performing. 
Well, <laughs> so, so yeah, so it's really cool. But like, it's I had funny trouble said loading it because, a couple times. Yeah, so I was just saying how great it is, and and all of a sudden I was rotating his website around. You can actually like move the header of his website around in 3D, and then I, I got an achievement in the website. Uh, I got achievement unlocked for rotating the the logo around. But as part of getting that achievement, I broke the website. <laughs> like, I can't scroll anymore. Oh, nice. But I'm looking at the top of his header. So it is a, great. I mean, it is an interesting website, but uh, I, 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 it's not my favorite cup of tea, but okay. Yeah, a little too much going on, but it's pretty cool. I, I, I haven't seen a website like that in a while. So you can check out the link in the show notes or just search how to fold a Julia fractal. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, yeah, I have a piece of news here. Wave pot music scripting. Um, I have a bunch of friends who are music buffs. I uh, tried to play the guitar once, and it was embarrassing. And uh, I have no music. Wait, wait, talent. Guitar Hero. I, I'm I'm great. No, I'm not. I'm <laughs> mediocre <laughs> yeah. at that game. Well, there you go. That makes I'm me a also, real musician. I'm also mediocre at Guitar Hero. Um, uh, but this is pretty cool. It's it's basically um, it's all JavaScript, so you know you can iterate pretty quickly, and you just write some scripts. Um, uh, you write a, you write, you basically they give you a function and, uh, you know, T comes in where T is, you know, the current time and what comes out is, is an amplitude and they have a few samples where they just do the, you know, sine of T, cosine of T, um, and you can hear the like little sine wave mix. And if you do like, you know, sine of two T, you can hear like a higher frequency sine wave. And then they even have some crazy examples where it's like they've made their own like techno, uh, uh, you know, their own electronic music um, that you can just like you can just execute in the browser. So I thought it was pretty cool. I've I've played with something like this before. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Uh, there's like a scripting, same thing, but it wasn't. It's not like live in an editor, uh, but it was kind of like a scripting language that you would use, and it did something very very similar to this. Interesting. Yeah, it seems pretty cool. I mean, I know nothing about music theory or anything like that, but uh, but this this looks like this looks really fun. If you're into music and you want to build your own sick techno beats, this seems like a really good way to do it. Nice. This this kind of goes in line with our last one. Man, we have themed themed news reports. This is good. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right, time for book of the show. Book of the show. So uh, my book. I think you should go first. All right. I think you should go first. Mm, No, you should go first. I think you should go first. um, Let's make this win-win. Let's talk at the same time. (laughs) Let's make a deal. How about I go first of book of the show, and then you go first tool of the show. Mm, Okay. All right. We just had there, ladies and gentlemen, was a negotiation. And I won only because I re- read Negotiating for Dummies. And I talked about this book a long time ago. Um, I'm getting ready to buy a car. Um, you know, we've talked about this on the show uh, in the past, but Patrick and I both have uh, pretty new families. So, um, Are you getting a minivan? Uh, I don't know. So uh, I kind of think the minivan is kind of cool, especially because – well, cool isn't the right word, but I like the minivan because it can hold – um, it's sort of like having a hatchback. Like it could hold bicycles on the back and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I also see the like SUV is kind of a nice way to sort of have have like a bigger car that could hold more people. But so do also, people not like minivans just because they don't think it looks cool? Uh, a lot of people really don't like. Yeah, minivans, minivans. I think I think the problem is I think minivans got such a bad stigma. Um it's sort of like it sort of like has the whole soccer mom connotation like like I'm completely indebted to my kids' happiness and and my life like doesn't mean anything anymore. <laughs> That's sort of like I feel like some people attribute minivans to that. Uh to to that idea and it's it's obviously not true. It's just a car, but um you know, and then so they came up with this SUV where it's like SUV. I think if I understand correctly, it's like a trunk, a, a truck uh, chassis. So you could feel like you're driving something with muscle. But like, you know, it's like 
He's like, yeah, I have a chassis and a frame that can withstand Arctic tundra, but I'm going to drive, you know, three people, you know, in suburbia, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you're relearning how to negotiate so that you don't overpay for your car. Exactly. So, uh, you know, I'm still in the early stages. I'm still trying to figure out what kind of car to get and things like that. But, uh, I have this book hot on the fingertips for when I, uh, um, when I get into that. So when you show up to the car dealer, you just plop the book down and then they just like, okay, okay, fine. Yeah. That, that's the plan. The plan is to, is to just start actually just reading quotes from the book until, until they give me the price I want. Um, but no, I thought this book was great. Um, you know, and so it, it's, uh, it's one of the few books that like I actually use as a reference. Like most of the time, you know, we actually, you know, today's day and age, you just look things up online. Like, you know, like we, we have a lot of books of the show on programming languages and things like that. And they're great, especially if you don't know the language. Like I'm reading the Swift programming guide right now. But like then if... Wait, if at as the end we of do the, the day, show? Well, <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you, if you just forget how to use a function or something, you're not going to use that as your reference. You're just going to Google it. Um... But this is a book where it's like, I feel like they keep going back to it. So I figured I would uh, go back to it here and make a book of the show, which nice. it hasn't been yet. So, My book of the show is a fiction book called Steel Heart by Brandon Sanderson. He writes a lot of books. This guy's crazy. I don't actually know how he writes as many books as he does. Some authors, you know, it's like a long time between books. And he doesn't, he actually has multiple series going, this guy. But like, how do you uh, think they do that? Like even Terry Brooks. Or sorry, Terry Pratchett. Oh yeah, he uh, writes a lot of books. Yeah, how do they do that? It's unbelievable. And his are his are mostly Discworld books, but like he does write other books as well. Yeah. But this guy's got like he's got at least like three series going, I think, like three different universes or whatever. Man, maybe I more. Don't know how they do it? Um, and he comes out with like it seems I'd have to go look at his, but it seems like every couple months there's a book coming out. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how people do it. Uh, and some people it's like, you know, I, I'm reading a, a trilogy and it's like been like two or three years since the last book came out. It's like, I really want the next one. The author saying like, it's going to be like another year at least. And it's like, ah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so sometimes they, it's better uh, just to wait till the trilogy is done and then start reading it. Yeah. The lady who wrote the vampire books, uh, uh, what's it, what's it, what's it called? The one with the vampires like and the werewolves. Anne Rice, like interview with a vampire. Uh, no, no, the one that they made the movies of, um, you know, the the girl like she she has a vampire and a werewolf, and she doesn't know which one to date. Oh, she ends up dating the vampire. Um, Twilight. Twilight. That's right. So the lady who wrote Twilight, apparently she was going to write, I guess like another like some kind of epilogue, um, book, but then the book got leaked out, and so she canceled it. And that kind of blew my mind because it's not like, you know, it's not like you, just, you can't cancel a book. I mean, it takes so long. It just, it, I thought that was pretty wild. It's, it takes so long and it's such an individual effort that like the idea that, you know, even if someone spoiled my book that I would just throw away a year of my life. Yeah, but you wouldn't wild. write that kind of book. <laughs> Nobody's going to spoil your programming book, my friend. No, I'm just saying like, no matter what book I wrote, if somebody spoiled it... In the end, it, it compiles. <laughs> if somebody spoiled anything that I spent a year working on, I would still just finish it. But, you know, then again, she's already written so many books, it probably doesn't matter. Yeah. Some people at that point, like, it's probably not for the money anymore, right? Like, Yeah, I guess if someone spoils it, there's nothing left. Well, something happened her. with the J.K. Rowling, right? The person who wrote Harry Potter wrote another book. Oh, man, I wasn't prepared for this. But she wrote another book, but she wrote it under a pen name. And I think it kind of got like, like it was well reviewed, but not like people like didn't get excited. It wasn't like a bestseller. I'm probably butchering this story. And then like kind of came out that she wrote, someone leaked, like her publisher or something leaked that it was her. And then all of a sudden it was like, you know, through the roof sales and all of a sudden it was the, you know, great book and all this stuff. Oh, wow. You know, but like she was trying to dodge it, you know, because she didn't need the money. So she just probably just wanted to write and not have people view it in the light of Harry Potter. Yeah, it's interesting. There was some writer who gave a TED Talk recently uh, who um, it was one of these, like, I think the, the topic was, like, how do you survive your own success or something like that? And basically, uh, she just said that, like, sh she had, like, huge writer's block because she was, like, consumed with, like, her own success. 
like not that she was like she was gloating over herself every day but but it was more just like she felt like how can she top that you know and the the short story is that she just decided to write a book like she kind of just got the cojones to write the book and the second book tanked everyone was like this is nothing like the first book um and then that sort of like gave her the freedom to write the third book which ended up being like her best book or something but Interesting. I, uh, yeah apparently like uh you know again like i was saying it's such an individual effort that like it's sort of like movies you know i would imagine like at some point you're going to the movie just to see george clooney and it doesn't really matter what he does that's just kind of a weird so so dynamic <laughs> coming full circle steel heart by brandon sanderson and uh this is kind of like an interesting take on the comic book superhero super villain theme oh, okay so it's kind of that way, but not like it's not a Marvel universe. It's not like DC universe. And it's a book, not a comic book, um, but kind of in, in that kind of theme, but with some interesting twists on it. So it was, it was nice. It was a good read. It's a short, rather short book. Oh, okay. So it's not a comic book. It's uh No, but it's like in that kind of world, right? Like same I kind see. of ideas. Cool, cool, cool. So I get to go first for two of the show. All right. Mine is Arduino. So we've talked nice. about Arduinos before, uh, and I recently used it for a project, and people at work were giving me a hard time because, uh, you know, everybody's like, oh, Arduino's overpriced, and, um, you know, you can get this other ARM device, which is 32-bit and 100 megahertz and only $5, uh, you know, and then b- by the time they finished their discussion, I actually had the project done on my Arduino. <laughs> um, and I'm not a, like... Arduino is the best thing ever. Like a lot of people try to do stuff with it that you should just move to another processor. But if you're trying to do like rapid prototyping, I've realized how wonderful of a tool it is because there's so much example code and libraries and uh, peripherals out there that just work with it and you just do it and it works. And if you need to, it's same thing with kind of Linux distributions in a way. It's nice if there's a big community because somebody probably asked a question. So it's good if you can ask a question and eventually someone answers it. It's better if you just look for the question and it's already been asked and answered. Um, gotcha. well, and with Arduino, don't you have to write in some wacky language, though? Yeah, but it's basically just C. Like, I just write in C and it works. Oh, really? Okay. Sort of. I mean, I don't know. I don't do any, like, applications programming in it, right? So it's all, like, manipulate some hardware is what I'm typically doing with it. And so gotcha. I'm normally grabbing some library and some example code and changing it just enough to where it works. And uh, it's really fast for that. And, you know, I install the IDE, I do the thing, and it's not, I couldn't imagine trying to do a complicated project in it. It would probably be terrible. But like I said, in the time that I could have figured out how to get a compiler installed, properly compiling and properly flashing, and, you know, the bootloader working on a $5, whatever other ARM board, um, it probably would have been very, very powerful and would have taken me weeks to, like, get working before I started. And I was done in, you know, like a couple hours for the thing I was trying to do. Yeah, the Arduino has Wi-Fi, right? Uh, Some versions of it do, yeah. Yeah, because as long as it has Wi-Fi, you could do almost everything on a desktop. At least, you know, if if you're prototyping, you don't really need to have that much logic on the actual I'm not sure sure where you're going, but yes. Well, no, I was saying like, like, well, because, you know... if you if you could do everything on the desktop and just communicate with the oh, Arduino I see, device, I see. Yeah. then you don't have the ID doesn't really matter that much, right? Yeah, so I mean that's one way to look at it, right? Like some people, even some of the Arduinos have this where they can pretend to be a, basically a keyboard, right? And so there's interesting like data logger Arduino stuff where you just want to like measure the temperature in your office, right? So you could try to go buy some USB thermometer and figure out some SDK, or you can like. Hook, hook an Arduino up to it and have it type in the numbers into a spreadsheet and push enter after the end of each reading. Um, it's just kind ah. of an interesting hack, um, but in some ways is really straightforward and quick. So if it works, it works. And if you need to go to something more complicated, you can, um, and you'll know sooner. So, and that, that's gotcha. why Arduino is my tool of the show. Even for, I don't consider myself an expert programmer, but someone who does a lot of embedded work, like, if I had a board that was my preferred setup and I went to it all the time, sure, maybe that would be better. But since I don't, I, you know, when I have to do stuff with hardware and I just need it done, um, Arduino. Yeah. Cool. So what's your most recent like home project, um, with Arduino? With Arduino. So, uh, 
I, I, it's kind of hard to explain. I'll do this other one. So I was trying <laughs> okay. to, I wanted to, to build like something for like, just like entertainment value to, um, move like a flag back and forth. You can kind of think of it. So I wanted to just like attach a servo motor to a flag and like have it wave the flag. Right. Okay. Um, you know, very patriotic. I, I don't want to have to actually wave the flag. So I build something to wave the flag for me. So in preparation for July 4th, you're going to have a robotic yeah. flag waver. So it's basically that. Yeah. And so I programmed an Arduino and just told it to go from one extreme to the other, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it was done in like, I already had a servo. I had an Arduino board, hacked it together and it was done. Before that, I built a, uh, a an Arduino that moved two stepper motors that were on pulleys for strings and they were attached to a pen and they moved the pen around a piece of paper and drew pictures. What? That sounds amazing. Oh. Well, it was kind of, the hardware part was interesting and then like it was just programming after that. It was like, oh, this is kind of boring actually. So you you uh, you could give it like a... So you give it like an image and then there's already tools. Like people have done this before, which I guess is why it wasn't that interesting to me because oh, it kind of felt cheap. Um, but like people you encode it threshold or whatever and then you do like traveling salesman problem like how do you go from all the the point cloud basically to form like a pattern that looks like the image right right. and then you send those coordinates for each of the paths um and the arduino would move the pen to that move it move it move it and you just keep streaming the commands over that sounds awesome man you should document these i mean i would love to see a video of that working yeah, but like I said, it was something other people had already done. So it was like, I was just following their instructions. I wasn't really adding anything yeah, but new. but Patrick, we don't know those people. We know you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, I, I'm terrible. I don't contribute back to the internet. I hoard it all away in my head. <laughs> okay. That's pretty awesome. Uh, my tool of the show is not, uh, definitely not as cool. But uh, I was actually talking to a coworker about sort of productivity tools. Um, I have a bunch of like, you know, at work, I have a bunch of email add-ons and all sorts of email hacks to do all sorts of crazy stuff. I have, like, this naive Bayes filter that runs on my email. And um, just to, like, you know, it can actually shave hours off your workday, like, if you can get your productivity up. Uh, but like, or at least by up, I mean, like, more efficient. Wait, um, it doesn't shave hours off your workday. You just get more done in a workday. Uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's... Unless you're, like, I don't know, most people, you... you kind of expected to work a certain amount right so like if you get done sooner do you just go home um i typically I end up doing really more like well so so i've never you know left at 1 p.m or something like that right but at the same time i don't really like like follow any schedule i just kind oh, okay. of like have this feeling like okay now it's time to go so you you get instead of working later you can like go home at a good time and still yeah, have gotten done a good work day's worth of work yeah, right. Um, so uh, this this tool is called NVAlt. It stands for, there was originally a tool called Notational Velocity. I think the tool still exists. It's for OS X. Um, and it's pretty cool. It, uh, it uses like this wiki format. So basically like you write in this wiki format and it has this like pane off to the right that has, you know, the rendered format that's updated in real time. And uh, the cool thing about it is you just it just feels very natural like you write what you want it, the note to be and you hit enter and you start writing the note and that has a search functionality it has a bunch of cool stuff um the thing is i don't really like the wiki format um i much prefer markdown especially like the github flavored markdown like the extended markdown has tables and things like that and so nv alt is a open source alternative to notational velocity which does which uses markdown instead of wiki markup um, so I use that. Um, I found out, uh, you know, because we were doing the show, I did some research, and there's actually one called NVPy, which also supports Markdown, and it's written in Python, so it works on any OS. So you can actually take notes on Linux, and those notes will magically work on um, OS X or on Windows or what have you. Um, um, also, it has sort of this, uh, it could be locked with a password. So in other words, you can put all your notes on, say, like Dropbox or, or Google Drive or iCloud or what have you, and uh, share them among your computers and not have to worry about somebody who doesn't know the password you know, getting access to your notes. Um, 
So it's got you know pretty good security there. It has the indexing and all of that. Oh, also you can at any point turn your notes into sort of like a wiki um, thing. So it'll basically take all of your notes, render the HTML, and then um, you know put them in file names based on the title and Cradle index. So it's sort of like your own personal wiki that you could publish to the internet. I've never used that feature, but I just think it's kind of cool. Like one of these days I might need that. Um, but uh, but yeah, so NV Alt. It's it's if you need to you know, kind of take notes, whether you're a student or you know during meetings or something like that. I found that one really useful. Interesting. I have to check that. I don't have a good note taking app, but I do take lots of notes, <laughs> typically yeah, on scraps of paper. Use, I used to use this Emacs extension. I forgot what it was called. Um, but uh, but yeah, this is way better than that. So this is similar to one I've considered before. To do dot txt. Oh, okay. It's yeah, kind of similar. That one. You check that out. Yeah, yeah. All right. Maybe I'll come back with that as a tool to show if I try it. All right. Yeah. Let me know. Try, try this one and try right. the. Right. I haven't heard of, of of that one. So if that one's better, let me know. Okay. So on to databases. D -d 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 data, big data. We're gonna store this away and update the row containing this podcast file. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I the SQL syntax for some reason like I could use it every day. Like there are some times where you know let's say over the course of a month I use SQL every day and I still don't remember the syntax. Um, I just I don't know why. Um, but uh, uh, but. <clears throat> The uh, yeah, I remember there's like select where select star in table or from table. See, there you go. Anyways, so you know, before there were databases, which is probably going way back because databases pretty uh, have been around for a long time. Um, actually, how long databases were around in the 1960s? So before that. And up to today, even, people use flat files, right? I mean, it makes sense. Like, you just have, uh, you know, if you have some file on your computer, um, you can actually do, uh, you can actually seek in that file. Like, most files are random access files, um, as long as you're not using, like, a tape or something like that. And so you can actually just seek to any point in the file and read that point or write that point. And so a lot of people will just write out, like, you know, text files. Like, for example, if you have a web server, um, every time somebody visits your website, you might append a line to some flat file or, or raw text file saying who came to your website. And, uh, you know, this is great for a lot of things. But uh, it doesn't do everything. There's a lot of reasons to use a database. Um, <coughs> you know, one of them is indexing. So the idea here is, um, you, know, you have a lot of data in your database. Let's say you have a list of names. So you, know, you have Patrick, you have Jason, you have you know Jennifer, Sophia. You have all these names. You know a column just full of, of different people's names. So you know most of the time you want to look someone up by their name. Like give me all the Patricks or give me all the Jasons. So what you don't want is to have to look through every name in your whole database and then pull out the Patrick's as you see them. Like you'd want to do some kind of pre-processing and build an uh, index um, such that when you say like, give me all the Patrick's, it's kind of ready to go. Um, do you, what's the difference between an index and a reverse index? Uh, do you know? Nope, <laughs> don't know. I don't know, I, I think, so you know, a reverse index is where I think it works like this. I think, you know, let's say you're, you have a bunch of records and index says, okay, record one has Patrick in it. So if I look for record number one, I want to get Patrick. Or if I look for record number 14, 50,000, that one's Jason. That's an index. Like you're indexing into the database. A reverse index is when you want to go the other way. Like give me all the Jasons or all the Patricks. So, you know, even a flat file could have indexing because, you know, you could just say like every 10 megabytes in the file is a new person. Yeah, so, so it's just reversed versus forward. It's just like a matter of how the data is stored versus how it's looked up kind of, right? So, yeah, so like exactly. you said, like if you have a log, right? It, you, first, you just start adding lines to the end of the log, but eventually you want to like have 
a way to go straight to a given day when it gets really, really big, right? And you don't want to have to parse all the days to find out like where a given day starts. So you may like put up at the top, like day one is at bite this, day two is at bite this, day three is at bite this, right? It's like a forward index because it's kind of like the way it's stored. Reverse index would be like, if some for some reason you wanted to go like the other way, like from a given entry to like know what day it was in, right? Like right, right. So it, it's not exactly the way it was stored. Um, you know that data in this case is kind of a bad example because it's probably stored in that portion of the log. But if it wasn't, like, hey, I'm at some part of a file for some reason, I want to go back to like how what day it was. The you know like going the other way. Yeah, exactly. Or like, tell me what days user X logged in. Or something like that. Yeah. Then you need a reverse index. So the point is databases do both of these. <laughs> so um, so you don't have to think about how to build. And it's actually very hard building those structures. Um, so you don't have to think about that. The database will do that for you. Similarly to what the discussion is, as it typically comes as data grows, right? So like it starts off simple. You do something simple. That's fine. Then as it grows, you start having a problem like caching. So if the file gets really big and you're accessing it in the same way a lot, if it's just a flat file, you know, depending on your RAM and your cache, maybe it's getting caching at like the CPU level. But as right. it grows like bigger and bigger, right? Like you want a more sophisticated caching scheme that understands the access patterns you're likely to have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean the the CPU will cache in its own like, you know, L1 and L2 cache, but these are very small, right? But the uh, you know a database can you know cache like 200 megabytes of information you know in main memory, and it does like the caching between like your hard drive and the main memory, and uh, and again the way that most databases do the caching is very sophisticated. So um, you don't want to be writing that yourself. Yep. No. It, it grows like you could write simple caching yourself, but yeah, more complicated. It's better for someone else to have done it. Yeah, definitely. Um, another one is redundancy. So, you know, you want uh, you want all your data s to be backed up in real time. Like, imagine if you're processing orders, like you're a furniture online furniture store or something. Um, you know, if your computer dies, or even if you know just the power goes out and and you have to y your computer hard resets. You know, if somebody is in the middle of an order and you double charge them or you forget to charge them or something, it could be a big deal, right? Or if you if you uh if you lose the entire your your all of your data and you have no way to recover, um, that's a huge disaster, right? And then it gets really tricky because the way you back things up, I mean you could have infinite loops. Like you could have a student record who which points to the classroom they're in and the classroom points to the the students that are in that class. So you can have these sort of like circular references and things like that. And so being able to, you know, back up something like that, some kind of structured data and to recover it, um, these things are, are really tricky and you don't want to be implementing them yourself. Similarly, trying to scale them. So running on one computer is all well and good, more memory, more CPU, eventually that runs out. And now you have to scale to multiple computers, also called distributed databases, right? And now you have a whole host of other problems you got to handle about, do you put one table on one computer and another table on another computer? Or are some users' com data on one computer and some on another? And then how do you split up that, right? And like, starts to play in like a lot of different choices about how you want to scale the data and you know understanding the problem set so that you know that you're scaling in a way that's going to be beneficial for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, most of these databases, you know, if you go to Amazon or, or Microsoft or Google or any of these like big services, I mean, there's just there's a ton of computers that are all working together to store like one collection of information. And yeah, trying to implement that again, really hard, very hard to get right. Even the experts don't get it right all yeah. the time, right? There's a lot of heuristics, a lot of guessing and hoping that certain conditions aren't met and things like that. And there's a lot of fingers that are crossed and, and, uh, um, and so it's definitely not like a solved problem and you don't want to be in the business of trying to solve it. <laughs> I mean, unless, unless you're getting a PhD or something in databases, but for the rest of us, you know, we should leave it to the experts. 
Um, also segmentation, right? I mean, most people access data um, in certain patterns and they might only need, you know, if you're looking at say a, like SQL, which we'll talk about later, you might only need one column at a time or you might not select all the columns. And so SQL can actually say, even though this one row of data is kind of one atomic thing, I'm going to break it up into pieces. Or as Patrick said earlier, I'm going to break each day and put each day in a different place. Um, and it can look at sort of your access patterns and also some hints that you can give the database. And it can you know, divide your data, segment your data into different pieces such that it doesn't have to do a lot of extra reading. Um, it can just read the part that you want and uh, do that very efficiently. And I guess it should be pointed out some of this we're blurring a little bit and I, maybe it doesn't matter between database and a database management system. <laughs> so oh yeah, that's in, a good in, point. In some way but like data all, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the the um you know, it's kind of a whole package, right? Yeah, so. but in some ways like a database is is a theoretical design thing, right? Like you know, for a relational database, I'm defining, you know, here's my schema, here are my relations, here are my constraints. And right. like, you know, I want some physical implementation of that, but you could arguably have different front ends that handle it differently based on like how stuff is getting put in or taken out. But in reality, I don't know of anyone who does that for any practical reasons. Typically, you have one database management system, which is also managing kind of like the database, the back end. Um, but database management system is where things like what Jason was talking about, like observing usage patterns and deciding what to go ahead and pull out a priori, you know, say like, oh, I know you might going to look at this next. That would be something that the management system would be handling versus like the database itself may have less of an influence on that. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know. That may be arbitrary. <laughs> the other thing that is really good for a database is like, so you, initially you start off, you know, kind of storing data, retrieving data. But then as you have like more users and more data, you want to do analysis. You want to say like, what kind of trends do I have? How many users are visiting my website each day? Is it growing or shrinking? What regions? And the more ways you want to slice and dice and analyze your numbers, the more you're going to want them to be in a database, which it's kind of understood how to write queries to do this. Um, otherwise, you end up re-implementing a lot of that yourself over your uh, whatever your other implementation of storing your data is. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, a lot of the database-driven languages are designed for people who you know want to extract meaningful information from their data. Um, and yeah, you're gonna have to be re-implementing that, which is not fun. <laughs> um, yeah, another one uh, we'll just kind of round this out is uh, validation. So you know, there's a lot of a lot of database management systems support triggers. Um, so in other words, if say you know <coughs> say or an entry is written for a credit card transaction and it links to some credit card but then that credit card isn't there um then what that means is clearly like some system has made some mistake um because it's tried to reference a credit card doesn't exist so you could have some trigger that says you know when i see a credit card um you know id for a credit card that's not in the credit card, you know, part of the database, then, you know, send an email uh, or, or page somebody or something like that. Um, also, you could do client side. Well, I don't know if you'd really call this client side, but you could do sort of immediate validation, right? So if somebody tries to insert a record, you know, without inserting its sister record that it's joined with um, or some other kind of validation, if somebody puts a negative age um, in the age column, uh, or something like that, then uh, it just won't accept, you know, that operation. It says, hey, you know, if, if you're going to put an age, it has to be, you know, at least zero. It has to be a non-negative number. Um, so, you know, a lot of these these types of validation, um, um, lo this type of validation logic is very easy to do. Um, they make it very easy and practical, which is these are all things that you'd have to write manually and C++ or something like that if you're writing your own database. So um, we're going to start talking about the different types of databases. And, and one thing to mention as a side note, and th it's a very detailed subject, so maybe we'll just kind of gloss over it, um, is the issue of consistency. 
So this is when you know a single person is updating or a single user computer process is updating your database. You typically don't run into this problem, um, is, but it's when you have multiple users that you begin to have an issue. Um, and consistency, one, the kind of gold standard, I guess, is ACID compliance, which is atomicity or atomic things uh, con- consistent, which is, I kind of grouped them all in together, but I guess consistency is one part of it. Isolation uh, and durability. And we won't go through what each one means. You can read about it. And they have very precise definitions. Um, but these are basically that what happens, what are the guarantees I can say about when I successfully insert a row or update, what do I know has happened or not happened? Uh, so like if you think about a bank, um, both my wife and I can go use the same ATM card or you know, my ATM card and her ATM card, which link to the same accounts, and we can try to draw money at the same time. Uh, and the system needs to be very carefully set so that we aren't able to draw you know, both the full amount or the bank will end up giving us too much money. Uh, and so in that case, you want to make sure that you understand what happens when there are parallel transactions occurring. Right. I mean, you know, in, in Patrick's case, the transactions are happening very slowly. But here, I mean, there's just there could be millions, maybe billions of people accessing your database. And so it becomes very likely that two people, you know, try to delete the same thing at exactly the same time. Um, and so. Uh, that's that can be very difficult to handle, right? Or two people trying to insert the same thing at the same time, or you're in the middle of an operation and the power goes out. Um, these are all just very difficult things to handle, and uh, a lot of thought has gone into sort of how to deal with that. Um, so, yeah, there's there's you know many different types of databases. Um, going getting back to Patrick's point, this is sort of more we're going to talk about the actual database side and then we'll get to some implementations of management systems um, later on but uh, the two that I think most people will be familiar with uh, are relational databases and then everything else (laughs) which everything else you've you've heard maybe NoSQL databases um, but basically that's sort of a catch-all for you know just a, a varied assortment of other databases and it just happens that um, because of changes in you know computation and networking, and in sort of the you know Murphy's or not Murphy's law, the uh, Moore's law kind of fading and, and things becoming more distributed, the NoSQL databases have become much more important. And so we'll we'll cover our we'll cover those in general. So uh, why don't you go first? What's a SQL database? I mean, I think if you know database, any kind of database this is the one you're likely to know. So. SQL is a structured query language. This is where you see select, star from the table name, where some you know limits you put on the query, and the query runs. Um, and similarly, there's a schema associated with it. So when you create tables and you have constraints, and some of this is particular to a database management system, and some of it is part of like a standards-based language that you can use. Um, and there are all sorts of things which support SQL-like languages. So you can write a query like what I just described, select star from users where creation date is yesterday um you know something like that it's a very common way a lot of things use this because it's a a very straightforward notion um but ultimately underlying it the relational part says how do how do i provide links between two tables um and it gets into what you'll you'll hear the term normalized and denormalized data um and patterns for that so you want to be efficient in saying like if I, have a whole, if I have a teacher and a teacher has a bunch of students, uh, the students also have classes, right? You can try to model, you know, kind of each row contains all the data necessary, but that's, you're replicating a lot of information and you're not representing the relationships there. That there is a, a, a teacher entity and a teacher entity is li- linked to student entities and linked to class entities. And those relationships can be one-to-one, many-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, right? You can kind of have constraints about what those things are like and keys that index into other tables. So like a student ID is the key and that might be what you would store in a class roster, a teacher students. um, And then there might be like a student record, which is keyed by student ID and contains like the student's address and their billing status, um, that kind of stuff. 
And that is the traditional relational database structure. And you use SQL to interface and do what, you know, joins between these tables to construct the information necessary to get the query to run and the information that you are looking for out, whether it be to look up a specific set of information uh, or do analysis. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so a lot of a um, lot of SQL and these kind of things is, as Patrick was saying around this this concept of IDs and and doing joins. So, for example, um, you might have say a students table, and it has you know a record for every student, but then that record also has what's called a unique ID. So you know Patrick and all of his grades and things like that. Uh, might be in the student table and it might be given an ID of like 123. And then in the, say the classroom table, um, you know, you might have each classroom also has its own unique ID and the classroom has a list of students, but instead of putting the whole student record there, you could just refer to them by ID. So, you know, you could say, okay, in this class, there is student 123, student 456, so on and so forth. And then you could take that list of IDs and go back to the student uh, uh, table and say, okay, who is 123? And so this sort of breaks a lot of these like circular dependencies or having to you know, have the same information twice is by storing a lot of these almost like pointers. Um, and there's very efficient ways of looking up things by their ID and things like that. So then we get to every other kind of database in the world as it seems <laughs> yeah. now. So yeah, NoSQL databases have really taken over for a variety of reasons. Um, there's several of them. One is key value store, and these, this is the oldest. I mean, this might even predate SQL databases, but this is, this is a very simple idea. Um, you know, imagine like if you had a SQL table with just one column. Right. Well, you had, I guess, two columns, the ID and then and then some other column. So that's all a key value store is. You know, you um, you give it the key and it, it spits back the value. Um, and so you could think of this almost like a cache. Uh, most caches are key value stores. Um, <clears throat> and so even though it's very intuitive, it's one of the oldest um, you know, types of, of databases, it actually proves to be very effective. Um, there's something called a column family um, database, which is similar to a key value store, but the idea is for one key, there may be many values. So again, if you look at, say, a SQL database, um, you have you know a student record, and you might have the key for that record, and then a bunch of other columns with information, just student name, uh, you know, grades, so on and so forth. Um, a column family is very similar where you have, you know, like a student ID um, and then you also have, you know, some more, a set of values about that student. The only difference is in SQL, the idea is that the ID itself is, doesn't contain any information. So in other words, um, you know, like Patrick might be given an ID of 123, but that like the application shouldn't know or care about that ID. It's just a number that is used in the database to, you know, look up Patrick. And it's even most of the time it's given by the database. The application can't assign that unique ID. And it's it's the IDs are chosen in a way which make indexing and things like that really easy. Um, with a column family or a key value store, um, the assumption is that the key itself is important. So in other words, I'm not going to say Patrick is 123. Um, you know, Patrick, the name, could be the key. And then the value is all the information on Patrick. Um, and so you can actually have multiple keys with the same name. And, you know, there, there could be collisions there that have to get sorted out. Um, you know, depending on how the, the management system works, the key might have to be unique. Um, but yeah, the idea there is with the column families at the key and the key value stores at the key matters. Um, thirdly, there's a document store. And this is something that's becoming much more common recently. Um, but the idea of the document store is that um, it's much more unstructured. So 
<clears throat> if you were to think of, say, XML or JSON or something like that, um, you can represent a variety of things in, in XML or JSON. And you could even, you could have a collection of JSON objects which have different topologies, right? So in other words, like, I could have one document in a document store, which is the Patrick document, and has like a list of Patrick's grades. But then I could have another document in the same database, which has, uh, you know, JSON, and has, doesn't have grades. It has something completely different because y for whatever reason. Um, so in the case of documents, it's much looser um, and just through advances in the technology and, and also computation power growing, um, you know, we're able to have these more sophisticated database management systems that can do all the things we talked about, the validation, the indexing, the caching, um, without having such a tight schema as we do with SQL. So it, with even with such a loose schema as you have in a document store, you know, given the right kind of resources and things like that, you can still do a lot of the things that we said at the beginning. All right, so now now quickly as like an overcap, you know, we'll talk about, because you may be thinking of a given database and like, oh, I wonder what it is, or maybe we just mentioned some databases you might be interested in looking up. Um, we're going to kind of go through some breakdown of the various implementations of the databases uh, and uh, some examples if we can give and what kind they are. So first, first kind of section is the lightweight embedded, you know, probably only runs on one computer database. And the first example that is very popular is SQLite, S-Q-L-I-T-E, SQLite. And it is a SQL implementation of relational database. Um, but it, it can be even embedded in your program and is super simple to use. And, you know, kind of one of those things, if you get, start to get any sort of complicated data you're trying to store in your program, you should consider using this instead because it may make your life, uh, you know, easier. And it's, it's quite efficient. It doesn't take, you don't have to run separate server, uh, and connect to it. You, um, it, it kind of reduces the complexity of that that's necessary. Yeah, I mean, I think it's even built into some languages. Like, I know Python has SQLite built in. I didn't know that. that so, nice. yeah, I mean, you don't even, you really don't have to do a lot of work to get it up and running. And I know Jason's used Berkeley DB for stuff, right? I think you were talking about Yeah, me that. yeah, Berkeley, Berkeley DB is pretty cool. Um, actually, I'll list another one on here, um, uh, MapDB. Um, and so these are also embedded. So as Patrick was saying, you know, let's say you have some program that you're writing and you need to store some kind of configuration. Like, do people, you know, what sounds do people want when they log in? Or, you know, it's some kind of music app, uh, you know, or, or sorry, some kind of uh, like music creation program. Uh, you know, what settings do they want their piano to set at? You know, these kind of configuration things, um, these embedded databases are great for that because you could just uh, load it from a file, store it to a file. It could be part of your program. You don't have to go phone home or something like that. Uh, you know, contact a server or anything. Um, so SQLite is a relational database. So you know, it uses SQL with the structure tables and things like that. Um, if you just want a key value store, so again, like you, you give it, you look up a key, you get a value. Um, then you can use Berkeley DB or MapDB. Um, Berkeley DB is uh, written in C++, but there are bindings for a bunch of different languages. Um, MapDB is a lot better, but it's written in Java. So if, uh, you know, the, the quick answer is if you're using Java, use MapDB. If you're using any other language, use uh, Berkeley DB. Next, we move up the scale to uh, something that you would probably be running on a server. Um, but if you wanted something really fast uh, and, you know, your data size was kept under control, but you wanted it to run in memory, uh, you get to your next set of databases. The one that uh, is you see all the time on, like, uh, Hacker News and other websites is Redis. Is that how you say mm -hmm. it? I actually don't know. But, uh, I think so. Okay. <laughs> it's like all these names. I only ever read them. So Actually, I just happened to, just total coincidence, I went to a Redis uh, meetup. And, and it is Redis. Okay. At least the people there all said Redis. All right. So, yep, Redis. And that's a key value store. So um, it's gaining a lot of popularity recently. It's pretty lightweight. And uh, it's really fast. 
um, if you memory if your data size is you know in the range that you can hold in main memory. Yeah, keep in mind like it once you shut down Redis or even like periodically it saves to disk. So it's not like it's not truly in memory where you know you shut down the computer and you lose everything. But the idea is, yeah, at any given time, all of the data is in memory. Yep. Uh, another one is memcached. I think that's how you say it. Or do you just say memcached? I've heard I it. I say memcached. Really? I, I heard know. people say memcached, but okay. It could be. I mean, I actually have, I've only said it. I've never heard anyone else say it now that I think about it. Okay. So I don't know. This is another one you hear. And this is often when you hear about somebody's having a performance problem. Uh, with their SQL database, right? Uh, we'll talk about some in a second. But, you know, they're having problems because there's some specific data that it just has a higher access rate or different pattern than what, you know, SQL stuff was built to handle. And you'll hear about people talking about this as a way to store data in memory and be have very fast access times and kind of alleviate some of the slowness that can happen if you have too many concurrent users to a SQL database. Right. Like in contrast with Redis, memcached, when you shut down the machine, it does destroy the database. So the idea with the memcached, as Patrick was saying, is is to use to augment another database. And uh, it, it's, to, it's for when that database is too slow. So you can imagine like things that would be good for memcached would be, you know, the front page of your website, you know, things like that. And there's a lot of, um, you know, if you use like Ruby on Rails or if you use you know, a lot of these, um, like content management systems, m you know, most of them will support memcached and, uh, they will, you know, things like the front page of your website, they will put in, in main memory. So I have no idea why I've heard people say memcached D before, cause it looks like it's just memcached. You're right. Oh, is, did you actually find a pronunciation? So, well, I, I was <laughs> trying to look for it. So I see other people saying that they hear it as memcached D. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't find a definitive answer. I think, you know, so memcache D makes the most sense because I think it's a memcache daemon. I think that's yes. where the name comes yes. from. But I just, I don't know. I mean, just because it makes sense, it doesn't mean it's right. So <laughs> it's kind of silly, but I remember when Linux was first kind of, well, when I first started encountering it and nobody knew exactly how to say it. Like none of my friends. Um, this is before YouTube videos, I guess. So you couldn't look on YouTube videos for how Yeah, to I remember say when people called it Linux. Yeah, right, exactly. Linux, yeah. Linux, Lin Lin Linux. It's like people would say weird <laughs> I've stuff. I've never heard that one. Uh, yeah, I heard all sorts of strange things. Linux. But now I guess there's so much video, right? Like, I don't know or what exactly happened, but it, it's I've never heard people say anything other than Linux anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm not sure what caused the transition. Maybe it is, you know, maybe that's real. That would be really interesting if YouTube like homogenized, you know, language that that uh, that'd be like a, something really interesting to study. I'm sure some linguist is looking into that right now. Using disk based server databases. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So the um, most obvious one, you know, first ones you think about are MySQL, SQL Server, Post Postgres. Um, you know, these are ones that a lot of people have heard of. They've been around for a long time. Um, they're some free, some paid, some varying licenses. Yeah, can you can you, you explain? Do you understand the MySQL license? No, I don't understand. No, no, don't ask me about any of that. I have no yeah, idea. I mean, it looks to me like if you use the MySQL, you know, client, even the client, then you have to pay them money. That's how I read it. But... Uh, but that can't be true, <laughs> I, I <don't laughs> so know. I don't know. There are people's whole jobs who are like around optimizing and, and selecting what the differences are between the different database. Uh, I'm not that person. I appreciate those people, but I'm not that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. There's a whole art to making MySQL run the way you want it to, given your data. And uh, Patrick and I are very happy to let people much more qualified than we are do that. <laughs> so that is true. Um, yeah. So those are in the SQL family. Um, if you're interested in the column family, which again, just a reminder, that's the key value where the, the, there could be multiple values, right? So, so, you know, column family, if you have just one column in the column family, 
then you have a key value database. So the, you know, think of the column family as being a superset of what a key value database can do. Um, so in that category, there's two big ones. One is Cassandra and the other is HBase. Um, the short story is um, the reason why there's two, they use kind of different technologies for scaling. So in other words, when you have to split the, to shard the database among say 10 or 100 computers, um, both each of those two, HBase and Cassandra, handle that differently. And um, let's just say the trade-off there is, you know, Cassandra is easier to set up. Definitely if you're running on one machine, Cassandra is way easier to set up. Um, but even as you scale out, it's, it's the, the setup um, and the maintenance is pretty easy. Um, but on the flip side, if you do have performance issues, it can be kind of a nightmare. Um, that's just been my experience. Um, HBase is harder to set up. Um, it actually requires a lot of um, um, Apache libraries and services that you have to install manually, like Zookeeper. So you actually have to, um, you know, install Zookeeper, start a Zookeeper server, and then install HBase, and install a and get an HBase server. So this is actually two servers. Um, so it's, it's got overhead, but on the flip side, it just seems like tuning and understanding what's going on is a lot easier with HBase. Um, so that's column family, and then for document store, there's also a bunch of them. My favorite is MongoDB. Um, I really think MongoDB is very clever in their API. I'm a big fan. Um, I felt like, so they have this kind of cool sort of REST-based JSON API. They also have a good Java API. Um, <coughs> they are now, they've recently added full text indexing, which is pretty cool. So you can actually say this column, um, you know, if I want to be able to do like fuzzy text searches on this column, you can just annotate the column and boom, you get fuzzy text searches. So just to recap, like if, if the column was, you know, say a web page, let's say, let's say one column of your database or one document of your database is, is a website and all the XML or all the HTML for a website. You could just turn on this full text indexing and now you have a search engine over the whole web. Um, now, of course, you know, I mean, it's probably not optimized for that much data, but, but you get the idea. It's, it's still pretty powerful. Um, you know, if, you ha if you're building your own wiki or something like that, um, it's pretty cool to kind of get full text searching for free. Um, there's also RethinkDB, which we talked about at the beginning of the show. Um, they're definitely like new, new guys on the block. So, um, you know, they are um, kind of iterating very quickly. And, uh, you know, I think it'll be pretty cool, but we'll have to sort of wait and see, um, you know, what, they're, uh, what they come out with in the future. It's still kind of early. All right. Well, that about wraps it up. I'm hoping that we didn't repeat too much of what we said when we did uh, query languages, but that was like a long time ago. It's like 14 episodes ago. So uh, hopefully there's not too much of a repeat. And uh, thank you guys for all your emails. Get lots of yeah, definitely. on our Google Plus page or community. I guess it's a community now. Uh, people post on there uh, and that's cool. We see them. Even if we don't respond, we do see them. And uh, emails to us are always appreciated. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ash, for your question. That kind of got the whole episode kicked off. So, uh, yeah, definitely, you know, post on the community um, if you have any questions or any, f any feedback or anything like that. Uh, we do read it. So, um, and it does give us a lot of inspiration for the show and things like that. Um, uh, we will definitely do Swift as the next episode. Um, we'll, we'll have to uh, beef up on our Swift uh, between, between now and then. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. So cool. I think that's a wrap. All right, cool. See you guys in a couple of weeks. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.